right now. Uh, my name is Lourdes Perestada, and it gives me, gives me great pleasure to kick off today's Grappa Virtual Congress Highlights and Meeting. Um, the goal of this meeting, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with it, is to have a, a rich interdisciplinary discussion um, uh, about the most uh, recent abstracts uh, related to psoriatic disease that have been uh, presented at the major conferences um, in dermatology and rheumatology over the year. So we we hold uh, a meeting similar to this one also after the EADV, the uh, ULAR and ACR, ACR conferences. Um, today we're going to focus on the abstracts that were presented at the 2024 AAD American Academy of Dermatology uh, meeting. Um, and specifically with a focus on those abstracts related to psoriatic disease. Um, the, the idea here is to have a, an exchange between dermatologists, rheumatologists, or potentially people from other uh, fields that are interested in the care of patients with psoriatic disease. And uh, we will have three young GRAPA members who we call young GRAPians, uh, presenting uh, uh, around three abstracts um, that were presented and these young grappas have been uh, supervised and uh, mentored by three senior grappa members um, to put together the presentations for today. Um, and um, I'm uh, moderating this session with Fabian Proft. Fabian, you want to say hello and introduce yourself too? Yes, thank you, Lourdes. Yes, my name is Fabian Propt. I'm a rheumatologist, and this is the main reason why I am so excited for today's session, because obviously I was not able to attend the AAD in San Diego in person, and therefore I'm really looking forward to get updated about the news highlights um, from dermatological perspective on psoriatic diseases. And I will listen carefully and have some tricky questions for the presenters, so watch out for this. Um, yeah, without any further ado, I think we can start and give some housekeeping remarks. Here are the disclosures from uh, Lourdes and myself without any influence on the um, construction or the presentations today. And as you can see here in the agenda, as uh, Lourdes has already mentioned, we have three brilliant young Grappians that are presenting the highlights and we divide it in, into three topics. Um, Ahmed Ugar Atilan will start with basic and translational science and he was supervised by Nicole Ward. Then Barbara Hernandez will uh, share the clinical highlights um, and um, then not ACR, but uh, AAD. And then we will go further um, to the Q&A, also following each presentation. And Barbara was um, uh, supervised by Luis. And then we will have the um, panel, uh, the, the treatment highlights, which are presented by Camila, um, who was um, supervised by Laura. And then we will have a pay panel discussion in the end where we have interactive discussion. And if you have any questions to the presenters, feel free directly asking them after the session or pop them into the question and answer field that you can see in your Zoom um, uh, account. And then we will try to have a discussion and save some questions for the end in the panel discussion. Um, and without any further ado, and now all presenters are present, I think we can start, and um, this will be on your um, Ahmed. And Ahmed um, is an assistant professor of dermatology at Pamukkale University in Turkey, and he completed his master's degree in immunology and inflammatory disease at the University of Glasgow in the UK. And he was supervised, as said, by Nicole Ward, a professor and vice chair of the basic research in the Department of Dermatology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And she is an international leader in the immunopathology of complex inflammatory skin diseases, including psoriasis. And in particular, her lab specializes in generating and studying mouse models of inflammatory skin disease. Ahmed, the stage is yours, and we're looking forward to hear the highlights that you both selected on basic translational science from AAD 2024. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's an honor for me to be here and a part of Grappa. And uh, before I started, I full heart to thank my supervisor, Dr. Ward, for her email with comments and support. It was really important for me. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we don't have any disclosures. Next slide, please. Uh, today, I'll be presenting two interesting studies from AD this year, and we can start with the first one. 
next slide, please. Yes, our first slides, uh, our first poster comes from Dr. Gilher's team. It is titled Perceived Stress Can Trigger Sortic Lesions in Human Skin in Vivo, which can be suppressed by epipetents. In this study, they wanted to shed some light on psychogenic stress and psoriasis relationship. And at the end, they suggested some therapeutic options. Next slide, please. Uh, from the clinical point of view, psoriasis exacerbation following psychological stress is a common clinical phenomenon. From the basic science point of view, neurogenic inflammation plays a key role in the pathogenesis of psoriasis. In this study, the researchers used a novel mouse model of psoriasis and psychogenic stress, and they aim to see the effect of substance P and neurokinum 1 receptor pathway in this relationship. Next slide, please. Uh, when we look at the experimental setup, uh, they utilize the transplant mouse model. Uh, probably you may not be familiar, so I want to explain further. Uh, in this model, they transferred healthy human skin to escape mice. At the same time, they took peripheral blood mononuclear cells from these volunteers, and then they activated these cells with high dose interleukin 2. One month after grafting, they intradermal injected these cells to the grafts. Uh, we can move forward. Uh, and then they waited for two weeks for full maturation of these psoriatic lesions. And then they treated this plex with topical dexamethasone for three days. Uh, after that, they exposed these mice with sonic stress for 24 hours. Uh, in uh, this point, they aim to mimic psychogenic stress with this, with this sound device. Uh, and only for active treatment group, we will call it group five, uh, they administered a prepotent intraperitoneally one day before stress exposure until the end of the experiment. We can move forward to see the treatment groups. Uh, if we look at in details the treatment groups, uh, they divided them uh, to five groups. Uh, the first group, uh, one, psoriasis induced, but they didn't get any further treatment. For the second one, psoriasis induced, and then they treated with dexamethasone. Uh, and third group, mice were exposed to sonic stress. And for the fourth group, it was sham stress group. The mice only stayed with an inactive sound device. And for the last group, was treatment group, uh, they treated these mice uh, with epipetent intraperitoneally. And if we move forward, uh, when we look at the results, first they looked at psoriatic markers like a thermal thickness and KI-67 proliferation index. As you can see, while untreated group and post-stress group show psoriatic features, Aprevitant prevented this post-stress psoriasis exacerbation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and similar results were found with antimicrobial peptides like human beta defensin 2 and psoriasin. Next slide, please. Uh, when we look at the immune status in epidermis, uh, mast cell activity and MHC class 2 expression showed similar findings with the previous results. Uh, we can move forward. Uh, according to the intracellular adhesion molecule 1, antigen presentation and keratin 16 expression were compatible with other results. We can move forward. Yeah. And similar changes were also seen in vascular remodeling markers such as vascular endothelial growth factor A and matrix pro metalloprotease 1. We can move forward. And then uh, they also wanted to check neuropeptides to get clues about neurogenic inflammation. And neurogrowth factor NGF, neurokinum 1 receptor, and substance P levels were found increased after sonic stress. And these changes were stopped through a prepotent treatment. Yes, we can move forward, thank you. Uh, when they checked immune cell numbers, they saw a similar trend with CD3 positive T cells, cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells, and CD11C positive dendritic cells, they can move. And, uh, and again, the similar trend with natural killer cells and type three innate lymphocyte cells. Uh, however, interestingly, they didn't share CD4 T sample T cell numbers, also it would be nice to see those results as well. Uh, we can move forward. 
Uh, and again, they studied stratic cytokines, uh, TNF alpha and interferon gamma, and chemokines like CXCL10. Uh, and next slide, please. Also, there, they studied uh, interleukin levels, uh, uh, interleukin 17, and other interleukins also found uh, to show the similar results. But again, it would be nice to see interleukin 23 results. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, we finished the uh, results and for discussion, uh, in my opinion, yes, it is quite innovative and insightful study, uh, but like every study, it has also some limitations. Uh, I'd like to highlight some critical points. Firstly, it would be nice to similar, it would be nice to see similar results with other common mass models like immigrant models or other models. Also, there were more common uh, stress models, for example, damp zone dots or uh, water stress. Uh, so, because I think it's important because sonic stress can have some effects on some specific cells, for example, fibroblasts or other cells. So, to exclude this possibility, it would be nice to study other stress models. Uh, and uh, I wonder if they expose these mice uh, with sonic stress at the beginning. Uh, would they see an exacerbation or an exacerbated reaction compared to the sham stress group? Uh, we can move forward. Uh, here, yeah. Uh, and again, they say this model mimics uh, psychogenic stress. Uh, so uh, an interesting and important point would be the see similar change uh, in dorsal root ganglia if this model is really mimicking psychogenic stress, uh, because this substance P uh, neurons bodies uh, stay there, so it would be nice to mimic uh, psychogenic stress. Otherwise, uh, some questions can spring to my mind uh, Would the effect of sonic waves on the skin explain all these changes. And lastly, for the technical, technical point of view, uh, they mostly use immunological chemistry to show change However, to measure protein expression and cell numbers, immunostate chemistry uh, have important drawbacks. So ELISA or other uh, multiplex assays would be better uh, to have uh, more accurate results. Uh, we can move forward. But at the end, it was a great study and it provided uh, really important insights regarding the role of psychogenic stress in psoriasis flare-ups. And it also proposed some targets for therapeutic options like neuroclinic type 1 pathway. Yeah, uh, we finished our first study. Now we are ready to move on our second study. Uh, our last study uh, comes, for, uh, comes from Dr. Uh, Katj uh, group. Uh, their study's title is Normalization of Molecular Signatures Associated with Proteins in Plaque Psoriasis correlate with its reservation following bimekuzumab treatments. In this study, the researchers aim to uncover the mechanism of its resolution with an IL-17 ANF antagonist. We can move forward. Uh, a previous study showed that uh, these bimekuzumab and interleukin-17 ANF antagonists displayed good efficacy in improving each. And this time, the researchers wanted to show the mechanism behind this finding. We can move forward. Uh, when we look at the methodology, uh, at the beginning they took baseline skin samples and the patients and the patients got first mecuzumab dose. Four weeks later, the patients took the second dose of the mecuzumab, and then four weeks later, uh, the researchers obtained eight weeks skin samples, uh, and uh, they used a previous study. Uh, no, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Net Camper group uh, defined some each related mediators in psoriasis by using transchromic data. And these authors uh, called these names as uh, each signature. And they used single, seg single cell RNA sequencing uh, to compare these genes expression between national and non national uh, sequence samples. We can go forward. And uh, before uh, moving forward, I want to address uh, the each signature because if uh, you are not familiar with this study, it may look uh, different. Uh, in this study, this group defines uh, some each mediators for atypic dermatitis and psoriasis. 
and they named them its its trans -tiptum. Uh, And then in this study, the authors excluded uh, some inflammatory related genes, and only 21 genes remained. And they studied these genes uh, on these uh, second samples. We can go forwards. Uh, when uh, we look at their first data, uh, by using single cell RNA sequencing data, they showed that these 21 genes were mostly expressed by keratin sites and mast cells. Uh, if we look at the UMAP charts, uh, dark purple dots are concentrated on the bottom of keratin sites bubble and uh, the above uh, that tiny mast cell area. We can move forward. Uh, when they checked for the expression of calicrane 8 and TRPV channels, TRPV3 channels, uh, they saw that uh, these mediators were specific to keratinocytes. And then they employed RNA scope uh, to see whether these two mediators overlap with IR17A and F infiltration. And the results showed the association with the interleukin 17A and F positive infiltrated cells. Uh, we can move forward. And uh, finally, to see the effect of bimekuzumab on the uh, each mediator expression or each signature, they used bulk RNA uh, sequencing. Uh, as we can see from the charts with uh, IR-17 ANF inhibition, in addition to total each signature, particular expression of calicranes, TRP channels, and histamine receptors all returned to normal levels. We can move forward. Uh, yeah, we finished the findings. Uh, when uh, we get to discussions, uh, again, there are some questions spring to mind. For example, they check that this second biopsy is obtained from each plex and they respond to treatment well. And does this molecular each signature differ between each and non each patients? And beyond this study, it is engaging that why only some patients with psoriasis suffer from each and others not. And lastly, do pure IL-17A blockers or drug inhibitors uh, use some same pathway in reducing in reducing threat each, or they use different pathways? Do they show similar results? Uh, maybe we should wait for uh, follow-up studies, and we can move forward. Uh, in conclusion. It's an important study to reveal some clues behind cirrhotic itch improvement with IL-17 pathway suppression. Probably the results from other therapeutic interventions will help us better understand the pathogenesis of psoriasis and cirrhotic itch. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, yeah, the floor is open for discussion. So are there any questions from the audience? I cannot see anything in the question and answer. So from the panel, do you have any specific questions to Ahmed and Nicole? Maybe I'll start with a question about the first abstract. And, and here I want to go to our mouse model guru in the panel, Dr. Ward, because I was quite surprised when reading all the potential limitations of this study, right? How, like, so I wanted to understand maybe a little bit better, how would you think what would you think, how how different would the results be if we had used a different mouse model, right? Specifically related to that point. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. So I'm I'm a little skeptical of, of the utility of this mouse model because it's taking healthy, normal skin, skin from you, skin from me. It's taking it from two patients and cutting it into little pieces and then grafting it onto the back of a mouse. Uh, and then saying that if you inject interleukin-2 along with activated PBMCs from the same healthy patient, that that is sufficient in and of itself to elicit a psoriasiform like skin phenotype on the skin, on the mouse. Um, and that if you treat then with dexamethasone, it goes away. And then simply exposing it to noise makes it come back. <laughs> so I, I really like Amet's idea of like, can you show this and reproduce reproduce these types of findings in a in a more traditional model, whether it is a cute model like a Mikkel mod or a chronic transgenic model 
like any of the ones that are readily used by us, my group, and others. So K5 STAT3 overexpression, K14 L17A overexpression, R KC Titumos. Um, these mice are traditionally known to be itchy. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the model itself and the limitations. They use primarily immunohistochemistry to make their claims. And, and I don't know about you, but it's very difficult for me with my old eyes to look at their images and, and really tell if what they're showing us in the little tiny square looks like it has a profound effect, which is why I think I met, made the suggestions of, you know, traditionally, if we're looking at changes in protein expression, you do it with a quantifiable method, which would be doing ELISAs, which are um, basically their sandwich assays with two antibodies against a cytokine, and you can actually capture the protein. And then there's a signal, whether it's fluorescent or another colorimetric reaction that we read on a machine. Um, so I'm skeptical. I would like to see more data confirming some of their protein changes, and I'd like to see it validated in a different model. Yeah, I think it's definitely thought provoking, and that it will serve like as a as a as a starting point maybe for to be replicated using other techniques, as you're saying, mm -hmm. right? See and see if we see the same results. I mean, for the clinicians too that are here, I mean, if you think about it, what what are the outcomes if you treat a psoriasis patient with a prepotent? Do the plaques improve? I, so, I, I don't know what the literature says about that, but I, I don't think it strongly supports that in a general population. No, at least based on, on, on my brief review of this, uh, is that um, related there, I haven't seen numbers related to plaques, but there is some evidence uh, about pruritus, right? So yeah. there has been an effect in reducing pruritus. And, and, and what we've seen is mostly, so a lot in CTCL and mycosis fungoid, so cutaneous T cell lymphomas, other predicted conditions with less literature related to psoriasis. Mm -hmm. um, so, I invite other clinicians in here, dermatology students, to see if anybody has other, other thoughts. But specifically with in terms of reverting plaques, that is is is, is like maybe too much <laughs> for a period on, uh, with the information yeah. we have so far, right? Yeah, especially with the short-term treatment, right? Like it's hard. Yeah. I mean, those yeah. cells have to turn over and get slough off. In a mouse, you usually don't see huge profound changes in histology, you mm -hmm. know, for two to four weeks, four weeks is sort of the standard. Luis, I saw you unmuted yourself. You wanted to make a comment? Yeah, thank you for the great presentation and congratulations for your hospital with this uh, lagoon. <laughs> Looks uh, great. <laughs> uh, second, uh, I would like to say that the main topic uh, during the AAD was pruritus. Everything was around uh, each and call my attention and, and move around the aesthetics, laser and cosmetic, no? And, and each was the start of the Congress. And I had my doubt about the models and and and, and I agree with Lourdes. Uh, I didn't, I haven't seen any uh, paper or data about this uh, drug. Yeah. And maybe for me also as a rheumatologist, when uh, speaking about the second abstract that was presented and um, assessing the effect on uh, of uh, bimikizumab as IL-17 A and F dual inhibition, do you think that the results that were shown here are specific to the compound or to the mode of action? Or do you think that this will be the same for every other effective drug of treating um, psoriatic disease? So one of the comments I met, made at the end was, you know, do you see similar changes in this transcriptome that's related to itch if you treat with just 17A inhibitor, right? Because if it's different, then it suggests maybe it's F doing the effect. But we know that the jack nibs are probably the best and most quickest itch inhibitor out there currently, right? You treat a patient with a jack nib and, and, you know, within days of them starting it, their itch seems to be relieved. 
Um, we, with, with the second poster that was presented, you know, we don't know if those, so they basically took lesional skin and did sequencing on it, but we don't know if they took it from plaque that was itchy or plaque that was just plaque involved skin. And if you look at the, at the molecules that are increased, the irony is that those mo molecules, like the calcrine family molecules, they're expressed by keratinocytes as they differentiate. And they're serine proteases, which means they degrade extracellular matrix, but they also have the capacity to elicit inflammation by cleaving receptors on immune cells. So their itch signature may simply reflect overlapping pathways that are involved in both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis and may be itch independent. There's an assumption made at the beginning that the overlapping pathways are going to be itch related. So the question of those pathways going down following BIMI is great, but we also know that the skin inflammation is gone. Whether or not those go down, say if you treat someone with a jacanib and they go down in that first week of time period when the itch is improved, but the plaque is still present would be an interesting way to look at it in human tissue. And also again, for my very basic rheumatological um, yeah, knowledge, this is something that you frequently see in your clinic that a patient is uh, telling that the skin is still there, but the itch has improved dramatically mm -hmm. and this will continue? Or is it always that if the skin improves, also itching uh, will improve? Or is there a separation between those two in the uh, clinics that you see in your patients? That's a great question. I don't see patients because I'm just a mouse doctor, but I'd be curious if the dermatologist... <laughs> The None dermatologists, just. yeah, the, der the dermatologists on the panel will have more experience and exposure. Uh, I'm curious what their answers might be. Luis, you want to go ahead? Yeah, that's an interesting point. And, and we celebrate when the patients say, okay, the plaques are uh, in the same position, the same site, but the pruritus uh, is below than the first uh, consultation uh, visit. So that is a, that is a, a very good uh, starting point. And um, surprisingly, for example, with metrotrexate, we detect uh, um, a, a, a lower pruritus before the, the plaques mm -hmm. uh, go away. So it's an important thing. And I think it's stimulating for the patient if they uh, at least the pruritus is better than the, the plaques. And, and and beside the fact uh, of using uh, oral or systemic medication, we have to uh, prescribe uh, creams or ointments or, or other things to to get better the, the skin. No, that's really important for for the skin. Yeah, and on my end, similar experience. Many times, patients perceive improvement in their pruritus before a reversion of their skin plaques. And uh, that is very encouraging and already helps them cope with the disease better. Um, and there are still cases in which plaques may resolve, but there is some persistent pruritocyte also. So those cases also exist and those are very interesting because then the, 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 the treatment consists on, on trying to identify further therapies, right, just to treat that providers when you know that you've met your clear, almost clear endpoint, yeah. right, yeah. when treating to target. So uh, providers, it, for some reason, it was still um, a very hot topic at the AED. That's We're still trying to figure out how to best tackle that. Um, and, and there's a lot more that we definitely need to, mm -hmm. to discover and understand to be able to give the optimal treatment. Does anyone know with the all 17 F alone inhibitors, they failed clinically in terms of plaque resolution, but does anyone know if they had an impact on itch scores? Because if BIMI is working better for itch than A did, or yeah. perhaps F did, right? Like I'm wondering if it's blocking F, like maybe all 17 F derived from Matisse tickling 
yeah, an itch, an itch sensory nerve that's causing the itch. And so the F blockade is helping with that. Or I, even bradalumab patients when they're treated with the, blocking the receptor. I, these are just some outside ideas looking at the data that was presented and, and sort of thinking outside the box about the mechanism of action. Um, I'm not familiar with IL-17F in particular and their improvement in pruritus at the top mm -hmm. of my head. I would have to look into it. Yeah, I don't know, Luis or Laura, if you have uh, any experience, uh, if you've read any uh, literature related to that in particular, but... No, 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 I don't. But definitely there's something worth exploring as you're saying, right? Why is it that we see this different response mm -hmm. with F, by blocking F as compared to the others? Great. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ahmed and Nicole. Uh, for working so hard on getting these presentations together, bringing this new fresh information to all of us and also helping us digest it because mostly for the clinicians in the room, whenever we have to read these abstracts and posters, they are kind of scary. <laughs> so you truly made it um, easier for us to understand what's being presented and most importantly, to be aware of those potential limitations, right? That um might be difficult for us to discern with our clinician eye only. So uh, moving forward, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the abstracts related to clinical topics. And this will be presented by uh, Barbara Agustina Hernandez, who is um, a um, dermatologist serving as an attending physician at the Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires, which is my home city in Argentina, my country. So I am very, very happy to have her here along with her uh, mentor. So uh, going back to Barbara, uh, she manages the clinic for psoriasis and hyaluronidase suppurativa at um, the in el Hospital Italiano. And then uh, Dr. Luis Masocolo has, uh, is serving today as the senior member. He is the head of the dermatology, uh, the Dep Department of Dermatology at the same hospital, uh, Hospital Italiano. He is double boarded in internal medicine and dermatology, and he has a master's degree in public health. And he's the director of Project ECHO, Psoriasis Argentina. This is a pioneering initiative dedicated to spreading optimal care practices to, for patients with psoriasis uh, that are uh, in undeserved areas. So welcome both of you, and you can start whenever you're ready, Barbara. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Lourdes, for the kind introduction. Well, these are our disclosures. Next. These are the three posters that we have chosen to present to you today. Next. To begin with, we will discuss the following poster, Hepatitis B Vaccine Response in Psoriasis, Assessing the Impact of Immunosuppressive Treatments. Next. Moderate to, uh, to severe case of psoriasis often requires biologic and conventional DMARTs, elevating infection risks. Vaccination before immunosuppression is advocated for those lacking immunity. Hepatitis virus B is a global concern with vaccination being crucial to prevent morbidity and mortality. Next. It's unclear how the immunogenicity of the hepatitis B vaccination is affected in psoriasis patients that are treated with immunosuppressive therapies. This study compares the immunogenicity of hepatitis B vaccine in psoriasis patients across different treatment modalities with and without immunosuppression. Next. The investigators conducted a cross-sectional retrospective chart review of 71 adult patients with moderate to severe psoriasis who initially lacked immunity to hepatitis B virus and later received at least one dose of hepatitis virus B vaccine. Psoriasis patients were from NYU Langone Medical Center and were categorized by use or non-use immunosuppressive therapy at first vaccination. Immunosuppressed patients were subdivided into those on biologic monotherapy and those on combination of biologic and conventional DMARD. Next. 
Hepatitis, vaccine, hepatitis B virus vaccine immunogenicity was measured by anti-hepatitis B surface antigen antibody levels with equal to or greater than 10 international units per liter, indicating probable seroprotection. And seroprotection rate was defined as the proportion of patients with antibodies um, levels equal to or greater than 10 international units per liter assessed after the final hepatitis B vaccine dose. Next. As you can see in this table, before hepatitis B vaccination, 38 patients were initiated on some form of immunosuppressive therapy, with 28 patients on biologic monotherapy and 10 on biologic combined with a conventional DMARD. Next. In the study, men predominated, and 30 patients with psoriatic arthritis were observed, of whom 29 were undergoing immunosuppressive treatment, almost all. Next. 43% of patients completed the hepatitis B vaccination schedule. The time to hepatitis B antibody testing from the last dose ranged from 4 to 14 months, with a median of 9 months. Next. Seroprotection was observed in 60% of the patients overall. Next. No statistically significant differences were found in antibody levels and seroprotection rate across therapy status or type, psoriatic arthritis presence, and completion of at least three vaccine doses. Next. Completing the full three-dose vaccination series didn't significantly increase seroprotection likelihood, but resulted in 2.86 times higher antibody levels. Next. Next. Uh -huh. Yes. No, no, sorry. Uh, uh, the viewer is one. <laughs> A multivariate analysis revealed lower antibody levels among patients on combination therapy when compared to those on non-immunosuppressive therapy. Every doubling of time post-vaccination led to a statistically significant 40% decrease in antibody levels and nearly 31% reduction in seroprotection odds. Next. In conclusion, the efficacy and seroprotection rates following hepatitis B vaccination are consistent among psoriasis patients irrespective of their therapy status or type. Partial hepatitis B vaccination may protect psoriasis patients, but full vaccination ensures higher antibody levels and longer lasting protection. The study suggests that flexible hepatitis B vaccination schedules for psoriasis patients, starting with the immunosuppressive therapy, may be viable, but emphasize the need for regular monitoring to ensure lasting protection. The second poster that we have chosen is malignancy rates in patients with a history of malignancy in the psoriasis longitudinal assessment and registry named SOLAR. Next. Malignancy is a potential safety concern for patients treated with biologics. Psoriasis patients with a history of malignancy are at increased risk for new and recurrent cancers. That's why they are typically excluded from clinical trials, limiting the availability of safety data for biologics in these populations. Next. For those who are listening and are not familiar with SOLAR study, SOLAR is an international retrospective prospective observational study that evaluated long-term safety and clinical outcomes for psoriasis patients eligible to receive systemic therapies. Among the evaluated systemic therapies, we can mention non-biologic treatments that included phototherapy, methotrexate, ciclosporine, and retinoids. And among biologic treatments, they included ustekinumab, adalimumab, etanercept, other TNF alpha inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, and IL-23 inhibitors. The authors presented uh, an updated analysis through December 2021 with a median follow-up of almost eight years. More than 12,000 patients with psoriasis were stratified by self-reported prior history of malignancy or no history of malignancy at enrollment, all the time excluding non-melanoma skin cancer. In the solar population, almost 5% of patients with psoriasis had a prior history of malignancy. Of these patients, 
19% had a history of melanoma and 82% had a history of other types of cancer. Psoriasis patients with a history of malignancy were less likely to receive biologics than those without a history of malignancy. Next. Patients with a history of malignancy were older, were more likely to be female and to have smoking history, comorbid cardiovascular disease and family history of malignancy than those without a history of malignancy. The results were divided between psoriasis patients with or without history of malignancy. Psoriasis patients with history of malignancy presented new or recurrent malignancy in almost 13%. Of these patients, almost 12% were exposed to biologics and 16% were exposed to non-biologics. As you can see, there wasn't a significant difference between the groups. Among patients with a history of malignancy, there were 57 new malignancy events and 36 recurrent events. Among patients without a history of malignancy, malignancies were, were reported for 3.5% of patients. Of these patients, almost 4% were exposed to biologics and 2.6% were exposed to non-biologic, also without the significant differences between biologics or non-biologics. No statistically significant differences were found in cumulative malignancy rates among patients with a history of malignancy exposed to biologic or non-exposed to biologic. The same happens when we compare patients with no history of malignancy exposed to biologics or to non-biologic treatments. Next. Cumulative rates of the most common types of malignancy were consistent with overall trends in psoriasis patients with and without history of malignancy. No malignancy safety signals were identified in patients treated with biologics compared to non-biologics. Next. The principal limitations of this study are that patients in solar are not randomized to therapy and the data are subject to various form forms of bias, specifically treatment selection bias against using biologic in patients with a history of malignancy may have occurred. For patients with a history of malignancy, previous malignancies were self-reported and do not include details on stage and treatment history, etc. Moreover, data have not been adjusted for apparent differences between the groups and subgroups were, uh, were variable in size. non psoriasis medication, medication history is unknown, potentially affecting malignancy risks. Next. To conclude, in this extension of SOLAR consisted with previous results through 2.5 years, malignancy rates were five-fold higher in psoriasis patients with a history of malignancy than those without a history of malignancy. Psoriasis patients with a history of malignancy who received biologics had numerically lower rates of malignancy than those who received non-biologics. Next. Overall, results of this descriptive analysis suggest no increased risk of malignancy in patients treated with biologic compared to other systemic psoriasis therapies. More data are needed to better assess the relationship between biologics and malignancy risks. The third and last poster that we have chosen is real world application of International Psoriasis Council guidelines for prescribing systemic treatment to patients with psoriasis in North America. Next. Previously, systemic therapy for psoriasis was reserved for moderate to severe disease, usually classified by the rule of TENS, BSA more than 10, FASI score more than 10, and DLQI more, more than 10. Classification based on this criteria may lead to undertreatment of patients with low skin involvement, but with significant disease burden. Given a lack of consensus of multiple measures to classify psoriasis severity, the International Psoriasis Council incorporated collective expertise to generate a consensus statement using a modified Delphi approach. Next. 
Current IPC guidelines suggest classification of patients with psoriasis as candidates for systemic therapy if they present one of the following. BSA more than 10, lesions affecting special body areas, for example, hand, feet, face, genital, or scalp, and topical therapy for psoriasis that have failed to control symptoms. Next. The objectives of this study were to evaluate the eligibility of real-world patients to initiate systemic therapy for psoriasis in accordance with IPC guidelines, and to describe the demographic and clinical characteristics of patients who qualified for systemic therapy under IPC guideline methods. Next. This observational cross-sectional study included systemic treatment naive patients from the Corevita Psoriasis Registry. The inclusion criteria were patients diagnosed with psoriasis by a dermatologist aged more than 18 years old and that initiated a biologic or non-biologic systemic therapy during registry enrollment. The patients eligible for systemic treatment was, uh, were those who met at least one of the criteria mentioned previously. Next. A total of 2,739 patients with plaque psoriasis initiating systemic treatment were included in this analysis. Of these, 82% were classified as eligible for systemic therapy based on IPC criteria. Next. A Venn diagram was used to visualize the proportion of patients who meet criteria to be classified as candidates for systemic therapy, and of these patients, 12% met all three IPC criteria, while nearly half met one criteria. Next. Almost half of the patients in the study were white women who neither smoke nor abuse alcohol consumption, more than half of the patients were obese with BMI greater than 30, had comorbidities of psoriasis and suffer from anxiety. Next. Of patients meeting IPC criteria as candidates for systemic therapy, the majority of patients exhibited psoriasis less than 10 years of evolution. Almost 44% had a BSA lower than 10, 71% had PASI lower or equal than 12, and 65% had VLQI more than 5. This is to say moderate to severe quality of life impairment with BSA and PASI lower than 10 or 12 respectively. Among all these patients, 89% received biological treatments. Next. Based on IPC guidelines, almost half of patient candidates for systemic treatment had a history of psoriasis affective sensitive areas, with the scalp being the predominant site affected. Next. More than half of systemic therapy candidates failed previously topical treatment. The most commonly used were corticosteroids. Next. In conclusions, IPC psoriasis severity classifications redefine the criteria used for assessing disease severity to facilitate decision making and better align with real world patients' perception of disease severity. Most patients who initiated systemic therapy in this large real world observational study met IPC criteria and were classified as systemic therapy candidates, including a substantial proportion with a VSA lower than 10 or PASI score lower or equal than 10. Next. A large proportion of patients who met IPC criteria for systemic therapy also experienced moderate to severe impact of their quality of life as measured by DLQ DLQI scores more than five. This is severity categorization based on PASI scores or BSA alone may not adequately capture all patients who might benefit from systemic treatment for psoriasis. And that's why it's so important this new classification of IPC. Well, that's all. Thank you very much everyone for listening to our talk. Great. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was great. Um, I'll open it for questions. But in the meantime, I'll bring up on my own. 
because I, I was thinking about the IPC criteria, right? And the BSA cutoff is quite objective, right? Then um, the... Um, I, the second one that you presented, sorry, is not coming up Pass, to my mind. BSA uh, uh, PASI or the ELGI? The, sorry, the, the special areas is also objective. Ah. But then when it comes to failure to topical treatments, that is kind of a, it's not so easy to classify patients as failure or not failure, right? So I'm interested in your thoughts and with thoughts on how do you define topical failure in your clinic? And do you think that's standardized across centers to be used as such a, as an anchor for criteria, right? Because we know that it depends on the patient also, right? On their adherence to the treatment, on the topical you give them and so on. So what are your thoughts about that? Uh, okay, it's, it's 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 a nice question, and we don't have a a, a guide to to follow. No, uh, uh, one one point I, I think is important if the adherence to the topical treatment is not easy to check and to follow, uh, mainly in, in men that we don't want to apply uh, creams and we have a uh, hair and things like that. That as is not easy. Um, sometimes you have uh, um, different uh, qualities in in terms of creams, no? And we have a, a lot of creams and a lot of uh, different uh, potent uh, potent potency power, and um, and it's not easy to 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 determine what's going on or what's the response to a, a particular cream. So. I think I don't have a, a perfect explanation for you, um, but we use the most powerful steroid in depending on the area to treat. And um, we treat for 10 days and we stop for 10 days and we re, uh, restart the, the corticosteroids. Um, but I, I don't feel comfortable with the uh, the definition to to say uh, something important again is the pruritus no and we we in we know that in 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 chronic psoriasis we we shouldn't use uh, antihistaminics no we should add uh, other uh, munic, uh, com um, drugs like antineuritics so we can uh, merge a cream with um, pregabalin, for example, no, uh, in order to attack for both sides the the pruritus and, and the plaques. And also, maybe just for my better understanding, with also with the existing criteria, with having a DLQI above ten, there's already. If the patient is suffering uh, significantly and has a significant decrease in the quality of life, there would already be the option to start with a systemic treatment, right? Or intensified treatment. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, and, 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 and I think this was a, a big change some years ago when the IPC said, okay, uh, moderate to severe psoriasis, it's not only ab uh, above 10. And this includes a lot of patients. Uh, well, it's hard to justify uh, against the uh, to the financial or to the security. No, okay, he has a, a passy of three and BSA of four, and and we need a, a systemic agent, and it's not easy for us to justify. We have to to fight a little bit. I I am specifically interested also in the perspective of Chris Lindsay, our special guest today is the patient representative. Chris, um, do you have any special thoughts on the presented abstracts at the moment? Can I invite you to the stage? Thank you, Fabian um, and Lourdes. Um, Barbara, what a great uh, set of abstracts that you've reviewed. Um, a couple of things, I guess, just from a patient perspective, if I if I walk through the the abstracts. So, um, 
the hepatitis B vaccination, I, I know the recommendation is preferably to be vaccinated before you start biologics, but it would seem to me that the data says that um, I don't know if we actually have recommendations right now or whether this data would be enough to update recommendations on how to vaccinate people during therapy and whether that's something that we should be doing and considering uh, sharing with Ingrappa. So, uh, so, so that was my, my first uh, question. Uh, the, the second one was on skin checks, right? So good news on the, the malignancies and no increase with the biologics, but I still believe that yearly skin checks are probably really important for for all of us um, and those especially on biologic. So just wanting to make sure that that data wouldn't change those recommendations for patients. Um, and the last one, I have to agree with all the comments that came through, which is um, we need more flexibility to be able to get patients onto therapy. It is extremely challenging in the United States, the games that are being played, and I can only imagine um, the worldwide perspective of patients being unable to, um, patients with significant psoriasis that may be severely impacting their lives, still being unable to access new therapies and to be able to switch to therapies when those aren't working. So I applaud, um, Bruce Strober and the IPC for starting to think through this. It may not be perfect, but I do think the data supports that this should allow more patients to have access to therapy and make it easier for clinicians with a rubric for prior authorization. And that would be my recommendation to them. Um, let's create a rubric that makes it pretty straightforward for physicians to walk through what prior authorizations look like. So. Sorry to data dump on you, Barbara, but uh, that was sort of my perspective across those three abstracts. Thank you, Chris. Very important uh, point, and yeah, always really fascinating for us to also include the patient perspective on this. Regarding the vaccination, this is a controversial topic, and this is quite interesting because this is very uh, the only yeah main topic where I'm aware that there are differences. Um, uh, significant differences between the European and the uh, US North American based recommendations on, on vaccination. If you should continue your um, uh, metotrexate um, uh, treatment before uh, vaccination, or if you should stop it. And uh, I think here the, 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 we don't clearly know, and I think the data that we have just uh, seen is not enough to change the current um, uh, way of practicing, but I think it's a very important topic for the clinicians treating the patients and advising and counseling the patients, but also for us, because if we want to get vaccinated, we should have the best response. On the other hand, we don't want to trigger a flare whatsoever because stopping the treatment, and I think it's a very um, yeah, important but nuanced topic that we need to have more data on to really give good counseling to our patients. Uh, so yes, I totally agree. And, and we took this particular uh, poster because uh, maybe you don't know, but here in South America, we are suffering dengue as never in our past history. We have a lot of cases and some deaths. And uh, well, patients, uh, call us uh, asking uh, for a uh, okay. Can I receive the uh, live virus uh, vaccine for dengue? And we don't know how to to respond to answer because it's an, a live virus vaccine, and we need two doses separate by ninety days. So it's a lot <laughs> for for to suspend uh, uh, treatment and the risk of flare up. So we are in the middle of the of a problem, no? Yeah, fully understand. And we, we face this problem if someone from Europe wants to travel to South America and needs yellow fever vaccination yeah. to enter the countries. And then we have the same situation that, oh, well, I mean, I don't want to put you in danger. I'm advising you to travel without vaccination, but on the other hand, stopping the treatment and uh, suffering from the disease is also not the ideal option. So I think it's very important to have the best data possible to really give good counseling to our patients. Thank yeah. you so much, Barbara and Luis, for the pres brilliant presentation and the abstracts that you have selected. I really enjoyed it. 
And yeah, maybe we can come back to some of the questions that we still have in the panel discussion following the treatment section. And with this, I want to invite um, Anna Camilla Martin, and um, who was supervised by Laura Savage uh, for the treatment update from AAD uh, 2024. Um, Camilla, the stage is yours, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Hello, so uh, good morning. Um, I was supervised, as you said, by Dr. Laura Savage, who I would like to thank for all her guidance into the preparation of this presentation. And these are our disclosures. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So these are the three uh, abstracts that we selected. First is by not Shackle at all. And the second ones are, second and third are by Dr. Armstrong, who is our president. And we'll be seeing as we discuss each of these abstracts that we kind of selected them because they all have to do with interleukin 23 inhibition, which, which was one of the main topics um, about psoriasis um, in this Congress. So we kind of wanted to bring this to light and then do a discussion uh, following all of them. So next slide. So the first abstract we selected it was the guide trial results after withdrawal in part three, the long-term remission in patients with psoriasis treated with gusulcumab within 15 months from onset of symptoms. So as far as the background, we know GUIDE is an ongoing phase 3B randomized double-blind trial for guselcumab, which we know is an interleukin-23 inhibitor. And this study had previously evidenced, uh, evidenced that early intervention with guselcumab can lead to the achievement of a super responder status, which was defined as patients with a PASI zero at week 20 and week 28 after treatment. And it had also even evidenced that after withdrawal of treatment, uh, the patients with a short disease duration had a 46% longer median treatment-free period than patients that had a longer disease duration. As for the aim of this particular sub-analysis of this study, it was to investigate the impact of the disease duration on the median treatment-free period and the long-term remission in patients with psoriasis. So for the study design, as we know, the part one of this trial enrolled 880 patients, which received gusulcumab at a dose of 100 milligrams at week zero, week four, week 12, and week 20. Then the second part, uh, if the patient achieved super responder status, they were randomized and received a, either gusulcumab at a dose of 100 milligrams every eight weeks or every 16 weeks, and they were stratified by their disease duration, um, dividing them in a short disease duration or a long disease duration. And the part three, um, they analyzed, analyzed patients that were super responders that had achieved passi less than three at week 68, and they were withdrawn from the treatment. So in the current story, they kind of wanted to do an interim sub-analysis of this study at uh, from week 68 to week 140, and they wanted to assess the passi outcomes and median treatment duration um, analyzed by their disease duration. So for this, they divided the patients into a ultra short disease duration, which was defined as less than 15 months from the symptom onset, intermediate, intermediate short disease duration, which was from 15 to 24 months from the, uh, the symptom onset, and long disease duration, which was more than 24 months after the symptom onset. So as for the results, what we can see was uh, very interesting that patients that um, continued to have a complete response defined as PASI less than three. We can see that when dividing the patients by their disease duration, the patients with the ultra short disease duration were uh, significantly a higher proportion of them maintained this um, um, PASI that was defined as the maintenance of the response. And it was significantly, um, statistically significant the difference between patients with the ultra short disease duration versus those with the intermediate short disease duration and those with the long disease duration. And in a sub-analysis that was mainly the observed cases, so the cases that they followed and observed, we can see that the, the same uh, pattern was analyzed and patients with PASI less than three, less than one, and even those with complete response with a PASI of zero, Again, we can see the, that the patients with the ultra short disease duration were the ones who in a higher percentage maintained these levels of uh, complete remission. 
as for the treatment uh, free period, which was mostly like uh, here, what they did was follow them for these several days and they calculated how many days the treatments, the patients maintained the, the response. So uh, this was defined as patients that continue to have a PASI less than five, which means that they did not have to restart treatment. If the PASI at some point was higher than five, then they define this as a loss of maintain a loss of the, um, the remission. And so they would restart the treatment with Rizalcumab. So the patients who were able to uh, to continue to be treatment free, they calculated the median time after the last dose of Rizalcumab. And we can see again that the patients with the ultra short disease duration have a much higher median time of uh, treatment free disease period. So it's what it was 456 days for the patients with the ultra short disease duration, 291 days for the patients with the intermediate uh, short disease duration, and 259 days for the patients with a long disease duration. Next slide, please. Yes. And in this part, they do like the comparison between the different disease duration. And we can see that again, when comparing the patients with the ultra short disease duration versus patients with a longer disease duration, then that it is um, significantly statistically uh, uh, a higher difference when, when comparing them. And also when they um, when they did the difference by the difference of time that passed by, we can see that at baseline, most of the patients were patients with a long disease duration, mostly because there was a higher um, amount of patients starting the study with uh, uh, psoriasis that had more, more uh, time, so a longer disease duration. But we can see that in the second part of the graphic, when we see which patients maintain remission, and also at the even lower part of the graphic, when we see which patients maintain the passive zero across the different weeks, we can see that the proportion or the percentage was in burst. So instead of having a higher proportion of patients with a long disease duration, we can see that the proportion of patients with a ultra short disease duration were the ones who, with the passing of time, maintained this uh, response to the treatment and maintained even high levels of passive zero. So we can see that at the end, at week 140, there were 76% of these patients that had this passive zero. And for takeaway messages of this study, basically we can say that very early intervention with glucilkimef can lead to a positive disease modification. So even longer periods of uh, patients without disease relapse following the withdrawal of this treatment. And also that early intervention with the treatment, such as in this study, uh, less than 15 months from symptom onset, we can see that this may counter interleukin-23 dependent disease memory formation. So at this part, uh, I would like to pass the, uh, um, the word to Dr. Savage, who wanted to comment a little about this uh, modification of disease. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you indeed, uh, Camilla, for, for that fabulous introduction to that study. And uh, I did, I just wanted to share with you sort of the concepts about why we may be seeing these results. You know, there's so much um, interest that's been taken into prevention of comorbidities and the development of PSA, but we're now moving more into the realms in what we can do in dermatology for our patients in terms of providing them with a longer disease, uh, you know, free period and actually spacing out their treatment. Uh, so we're reducing the treatment burden for patients as well. And it's hypothesized that this is related to tissue resident memory T cells. And, you know, we, we see that when patients have their disease cleared with therapy, when they then have a uh, disease trigger and have a flare, we see those psoriatic plaques returning in the same place. And that's because of these CD8 positive tissue resident memory T cells that sit and reside in the dermis. Um, and then if there is a further uh, antigenic stimuli, then, you know, these uh, can very rapidly produce more IL-17 and the patients get recurrence of their psoriatic plaques. If you go to the next slide for me, Fabian. But interestingly, this is looking at those CD8 positive TRM counts um, by the super responder and non-super responder status on the left and the by the disease duration, long versus short on the right-hand side. Uh, and this is data from the um, biomechanical um, substudy that was done as part of GUIDE. And you can see there that the patients who had a short disease duration when they were treated with guselkimab, you can see that their 
TRM levels responded much more quickly and returning to a non-lesional level compared to those patients with a longer disease duration. So this may account for why we're seeing the results that we've seen um, just presented right now in, in guide. But similarly as well, if you are a super responder, then again, you're much more likely to have non-lesional levels of TRM, i.e. clear out those pathogenic tissue resident cells that are sat there ready to produce HAL17 um, if you are a super responder. So it, it, it's adding credence to this concept about in earlier intervention in patients. Um, again, how feasible that is in the clinical practice to get patients through the door and treated and onto a biologic within 15 months of their first disease or within 24 months of their disease first occurring, I don't know. Um, but it is certainly... Um, a, a good argument for us to go to the payers, I think, to say why we want to escalate our patients up the treatment ladder and have more ready access to biologic therapy. And then I think the final thing just to say was that, of course, this isn't just specific to gaselkimab. It does look like this may be a class effect. And if you were in the late breakers at the AAD, you'll have also seen um, the uh, initial data presented from the knockout trial, which again is looking at TRMs in patients um, treated with rizankizumab. So a very similar um, approach whereby um, looking at treating patients with a high uh, induction dose of rizankizumab, a little bit like they're doing currently in patients with inflammatory bowel disease on, on, under license to see whether or not you can induce a longer term remission by decreasing these TRMs um, in the skin of patients affected by psoriasis. So um, interesting data if you want to go and do a little further reading around this. And I'll back to Camilla now. So for our second abstract, we selected uh, this study called Real World Switch Rates in Patients with Psoriasis Treated with Biologics Over Three Years in the United States, as I said by our president. And as for the background, we know that a certain biologic therapy for a patient with psoriasis can be ineffective and or not well tolerated. And this will lead to the patient switch, uh, switching the therapy. And a previous study, yes, still from our from our president, had documented that IL-23 inhibitors have had the lowest switching rate as compared to other biologics over a 12 and 24 month period in this study. And we also uh, wanted to present this, which was an abstract from the AAD last year that showed that not only Rizankizumab uh, was also the biologic with less switch rates over 12 months, but also we wanted to show this to emphasize that this switchment of treatment can also lead to other outcomes, such as a, a higher per, um, amount of outpatient visits, a higher need for supportive care and use of topicals. And uh, this will lead actually to over, overall bigger costs in healthcare. So this has a, a big impact in this in in all of these issues. Next slide, please. So uh, the aim of this particular study was to examine the switch rates of patients with psoriasis using biologics over a span of thirty six months. And as for this study design, it was a retrospective cohort analysis using data from the Merative Market Scan uh, Research Databases in the USA. In the USA. And the eligible patients were those who were more than 18 years old and had more than two medical claims for psoriasis who initiated a biological therapy that was approved for moderate to severe black psoriasis. And the outcome was the switch rate, which was uh, documented as the proportion of patients that switched to a new biologic, a premolast or docrovacitinib within 36 months follow-up after the index initiation of uh, the first biologic. Next slide, please. And as for the results, what we can see was the survival probability uh, or the maintenance of that index biologic over the course of 36 months was higher. So a higher higher percentage of first, uh, patients with brisankizumab did not switch treatment or maintained their index uh, treatment with this biologic. And this was uh, followed by um, the guselkinumab, then by ixekinumab, then ustekinumab, Secukinumab, and lastly, adalimumab. And then also we can see that there was a high percentage of patients switching biologics. So when we see at 12 months, the overall switch rate was 14%. At 24 months, it was 25%. And at 36 months, it was 34% uh, of patients. So it was a high proportion of patients that would also switch their biologic. Next slide, please. And this is when we see the risk ratio or the hazard ratio of other treatments when compared to rizankizumab, which was the one with the lowest switch rate. So we can see that um, 
when we compare it to adalimumab, sikikinumab, ustekinumab, ixikinumab, gusolkimab, other treatments, we can see that they have a, has a high hazard ratio uh, into switching the therapy when compared to rizankizumab. Next slide, please. The limitations of this study was, and the authors uh, make this very clear, that they can make no conclusions regarding the efficacy or safety of this treatment. So there is, is since the data used for this study was claims data from uh, Merck scan, as we, as we mentioned, there is no uh, way of knowing what was the reason that the patients changed the, the, the therapy. And as for the takeaway messages, basically we wanted to conclude the, and the study concluded that the treatment switching in patients with psoriasis using biologics seems to be considerable over the course of 36 months. And that, that as showed in previous studies, we can see that a recent kizumab was associated with the lowest risk of changing to other biologics. And lastly, for the third uh, abstract that we selected, this one is improvements in patient reported symptoms and signs of moderate to severe psoriasis with GNG 77, 24, 21, 13, the results of the Frontier 1 study. As for the background, uh, we know that this treatment is a first-in-class targeted oral peptide that uh, it binds to the interleukin-23 receptor and selectively inhibits it. So we can see that it acts differently than other IL-23 inhibitors that we know that will bind to the um, subunit P19 uh, or P40 of interleukin-23. This other medication actually um, joins, as, as we said, the receptor and will inhibit it uh, selectively. And a uh, previous uh, part of this study, which is the Frontier 1, had proved that this medication uh, significantly uh, leads to a greater clinical efficacy when compared with placebo, which we can see in the next slide, please. So this was the first part of this study that we wanted to present for the background. So we can see that when compared to placebo, uh, in all the different doses used, because this was analyzed with different doses, we can see that there was clinical eff efficacy with this treatment, and we can see that this was uh, a, a little bit higher when with the higher doses. The best one was seen with uh, the dose of 100 milligrams used twice daily. So the aim of this study was to assess the impact of this treatment on patient response, and this was evaluated using patient reported signs and symptoms using the psoriasis symptom and sign diary or PSDD. PSSD. And as for the study design, as I told you, the patients received this uh, medication in different doses. So either 25 once daily, 25 milligrams twice daily, 50 milligrams daily, 100 milligrams daily, or 100 milligrams twice per day or placebo. And they were assessed with the PSSD, which captures five different symptoms, which are each pain, uh, stinging, burning, or skin tightness, and six different signs, dryness, creaking, scaling, shredding, or flaking, redness, and bleeding. And the clinically meaningful improvement, which was a, a four-point reduction, was then analyzed. So for the results, we can see that when compared to placebo, there was a much higher proportion of patients uh, um, receiving that uh, clinical meaningful impact in their symptom score and sign score across all of the different symptoms and signs analyzed with all the doses of, the, of this medication. Next slide, please. And we can also see that when analyzed still with the different uh, doses, the, the patients that achieved a clinical meaningful impact in each score and in pain score were, were also higher in patients treated with this medication when compared to placebo. And we can see that uh, the response was actually very, very fast. So when we see in the H score, we can see that even at week one, there's already a big difference between placebo and the clinical meaningful impact in, in, in the H score. And when analyzing in pain, we can see that by week four, there was already a big difference between placebo and patients receiving the treatment. Next slide, please. And also when we see, this is the part where they analyzed patients that achieved a complete response. So a score of zero in the symptom score and a score of zero uh, in the sign scores. And we can also see that there was many patients uh, across the different doses of this medication 
that achieved a complete response in these two different um, when seeing the, the symptoms and the signs. And this was not achieved with placebo. As we can see, 0% of patients in placebo uh, achieved this complete uh, response. Well, different amounts of patients that with a percentage going from a 16.3 to 27.8 percent actually achieved a complete uh, score of zero or a complete uh, response when um, assessing the symptoms, and a 2.3 to an 18 percent when assessing the sign score. So for the takeaway messages, we can see that this new medication is associated with high proportions of clinical meaningful improvement from baseline in the PSSD symptom and sign scores in patients that had a moderate to severe psoriasis. And we can also see that uh, patients with this medication have a rapid response and early improvements in their reported symptoms and signs of disease. And I don't know if Dr. Savage also wanted to comment some on, on this. Yeah, no, thank you very much indeed, um, Camilla. I'm, I'm conscious of time, but just to say, you know, we wanted to highlight, um, obviously there were so many different treatments that were presented at the AED, but we wanted to sort of pick a bit of a theme um, and highlight some of the kind of new ways of using some of the molecules that we have, but also looking at some of the innovations, particularly in the L23 space and, um, you know, giving patients the choice around whether they now choose their drug to be oral or subcutaneous and that, you know, the benefits that might, may have to, to patients in terms of convenience. Um, so yeah, I think it's exciting times and um, well done, excellent presentation, thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the presentation. Maybe also again for me as a Rumi, can you give me a short uh, perspective? How are the data of the um, last abstract that you presented comparing to the existing modes of action or especially also the subcutaneous? How is it when you compare that? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because actually we know the L23 P19 inhibitors, um, guselkimab and rizinkizumab, particularly in, or in psoriasis at least, um, have very, very high levels of efficacy and repeatedly come out on top in network meta-analyses. And you almost wonder what the drive is for the companies to then go ahead and produce an oral form. But, you know, there are some patients that will prefer to have a, an oral medication and the convenience that, that brings for them. So, and the data to me look very impressive. You know, 40% of patients achieving complete skin clearance with an oral medication is, is you know, essentially unheard of. We've not had particularly good success with the Primalast. Ducrevacitinib has shown a little bit more promise, but perhaps what we're used to seeing with adlimumab in the skin. Um, and, you know, we've already had some primary failures with Ducre. So it's interesting to see how this and potentially the oral IL-17 nanobodies are going to perform as well in, in psoriasis. Um, and of course, we, you know, we don't know about data in psoriatic arthritis as well, Fabian. You know, I know the jury can be very much out still about L23 inhibition, um, particularly in the uh, axial uh, PSA patients. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether there's any better pe uh, tissue penetrance with these oral uh, medications. And just all, again, for my understanding, I know a rather provocative, the, does the um, results from the first study that you presented with the super responders uh, according also and then the treatment response according to the disease duration, could this drive us to initiate more effective treatments earlier and maybe overcome the longer phase of topical treatments? Because we know from based on this data that if you treat early, you can really somehow reset the whole immunological uh, asset. Yeah. I think you're right, Fabian. I absolutely think you're right. And I think that's what we should be striving for. You know, it's not just the guide study that showed that, but there's data coming from Step In and from Knockout and other studies showing that if we can treat earlier, um, and, you know, and it's across the board, it's treating it as a systemic disorder. We know that we see less cardiovascular disease, we see less psoriatic arthritis in patients who've initiated biologic treatment earlier. And of course, it's, you know, we need to get health economists to step away from looking at drug acquisition costs and actually look at the bigger picture of all the indirect costs as well. If you've got patients, developing all those comorbidities and having absenteeism from work, et cetera, because of uncontrolled psoriatic disease. You know, what are the societal costs there in the long term compared to putting somebody onto a biologic? And of course, this conversation will evolve over the next decade or so until many of these treatments then become, you know, they lose their exclusivity and we get more and more biosimilars being produced. And then I, I think we will very much move to using drugs with a, a better safety profile better tolerability and higher efficacy much, much earlier. Um, but I say the challenge still comes in that they do have a high price point and therefore many people can't access them early on.
Um, and following up on that first abstract, I was wondering if, Nicole, you would like to comment on the TRMs and maybe Fabian, we could go back to the slide that Laura presented so nicely um, and, and maybe have a further discussion on that point, which I think it's really interesting how what we're seeing clinically correlates what's being seen in, in from a basic science standpoint, right? Yeah, this is this is where I think things are really exciting. And you know, to my knowledge, no one studies this in preclinical psoriasis models because no one's really studying it, right? So it, it Andy Blavel really has been leading the charge with the clinical studies looking at long-term remission and whether it is because it's depleting you know, the TRM markers. And I think, I think for skin disease, this is great, but, you know, someone mentioned already that the likelihood that this has significant impact on PSA, as well as it does on skin psoriasis, that's where the huge gap is, right? Like, I feel like we're getting really good at treating short-term and potentially even long-term skin psoriasis. So, you know, people talk about cure and at the International Psoriasis Council, we talk about like, what is cure? Is cure no skin disease? Is it no skin disease off biologic? Is it no skin disease on biologic? Like, how do you define cure? And when we think about cure for plaque on the skin, you know, targeting the TRMs is, is really the primary focus currently um, at sort of the clinical preclinical level, although it's very difficult to study preclinically. Um, but no one ever talks about the fact that there's other components of psoriasis that don't respond as well, <laughs> right? We're still talking about an ACR20 for the most part when we talk about psoriatic arthritis and, 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 and it's domain specific. So, okay, maybe we're getting some effect on the peripheral disease, maybe on the enthesitis, but what about the axial components? And it's so much more complicated. And I feel like we're so not even close to understanding psoriatic arthritis pathogenesis. So I know we're talking about the AD, but you know, the ACR is a completely different clinical meeting. And unfortunately, there's not as much basic science at it yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I think the gap really is how do what we're finding in skin psoriasis, how does it translate to psoriatic arthritis if it does? Because currently, if all these biologics that work on skin disease only improve the different domains of psoriatic arthritis to a 20% improvement, clearly there's something missing. And it's possible that we're completely bombing on identifying the critical pathogenic pathways. And you know, what's exciting though, is that all the technology has finally gotten us to the point where we can now get synovial tissue from psoriatic arthritis patients, and we can do spatial transcriptomics and single cell sequencing on it. And so what's interesting is when you look at the new data that's coming out of our labs, it makes sense why TNF alpha has worked the best because there's a lot of TNF alpha in the synovium, but there's a lot of other cells and cytokines and players that no one's ever really looked at as potential players in pathogenesis of PSA. And I think we're maybe finally at sort of the starting point for learning more about how PSA pathogenesis is different than psoriasis pathogenesis. And I'm well, speaking as a skin scientist. <laughs> it's great, but this is why we're collaborative, isn't it? You know, we've got to yeah, see yeah. this as one disorder and not just as, as two separate it is. Times. And it and it, you know, and it, it's it's I just literally submitted a NIH grant yesterday afternoon looking at the different path of pathogenesis of psoriatic arthritis. And, you know, is it a T cell mediated disease? Mm. I don't <laughs> know. I mean, people thought MS and lupus and RA potentially were T cell mediated. And we found that, you know, for some of those diseases targeting alternative immune cells, like B cells seems to work more effectively because 
the B cells appear to have some capacity to modulate T cell response at a higher level. So I think as we gain more information from humans and have the capacity to analyze it a lot more deeply than just doing sort of immunist chemistry, uh, I think I'm hoping dearly that the psoriatic arthritis field is also going to have a similar paradigm shift as what we're seeing for skin psoriasis. Yeah, and of course there are studies ongoing. Dennis McGonigal's doing the Modify study. Um, so again, I'm sure you're aware of that. And I know he's going to present some data at, uh, I think at ULA, um, Fabian. So you'll have to report back to us uh, when you do the highlights from, from ULA on that. And we would like to have you also attending that conference, right, to... to uh... To, to, first of all, to, to be able to see those aspects, but also to to bring your thoughts about having all the knowledge from the psoriasis field, how that uh, fits into the PSA work. And Fabian, I don't know if you want to comment on that. No, I can only fully agree. I think my this is my, my hypothesis is that most likely it is quite similar with PSA as well. If you just treat the skin disease as early as possible and try to interrupt and disrupt the autoimmune um, response earlier, I think that you might be able to prevent also PSA development in the future. So I think the key will be really to have a better approach to identify those patients that might um, develop PSA later on and maybe treat them more intensively at an earlier stage to prevent the outbreak of the disease. So I think this will be hopefully what we are discussing in the upcoming years. But um, Laura was already giving me the perfect path because I think we are already over the time. I really enjoyed the presentations given by the young Grappians. A big shout out to the great work that you've done. Um, and thanks to all the supervisors giving also the learning um, opportunity to the young Grappians while pre um, preparing the presentations. And as uh, Laura has just mentioned, Euler is coming up closely because we will meet in Vienna at the beginning of June, and we will also have the report back here in the same format than with the Eula highlights. And keep your eyes open, and we hope to see many of you also from the Durham community when we are discussing the rheumatological highlights that are going to be present presented at the Eula. Um, Thank you, Lourdes, for all the perfect presentation uh, pre preparation for this meeting and guiding through this afternoon or morning for your time. Thanks for you, all of you listening and your interest. And yeah, thank you so much. And I think uh, without any further, um, Lourdes, do you want to close the meeting? No, just thank everyone, all the, 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 the young group of members, the senior members, everyone for your hard work and time and, and, and actually making this session so special with all your contributions and all the attendees who participated today. So thank you. Thank you, Annie, also for your work behind the scenes and Fabian. <laughs> nice to see you all and we'll see you um, at the ULAR uh, Virtual Congress. Bye for now. Thank you, bye-bye.